all right, so here's a few news articles. Um, this is pretty hard to do. If you were at Caitlin's talk on Tuesday, it was wonderful. She was talking about picking up the radio signals from satellites. But another fun thing to do is take the pictures of satellites. And the one thing she said, people asked if you can see the satellite, and they're all too dim to see. But the one thing that is bright enough to see with the naked eye is the International Space Station. And if you time your shot very carefully, you can catch it going across the sun or the moon, but you only have one second to do it. Anyway, um, this guy is a champion at getting these photographs of the International Space Station doing interesting things. And so it is just amazing. The politics continue to be amazing. This is exactly what the Democrats said would be the worst thing Trump would do, and he's doing it. He's claiming to have won the election when he clearly hasn't won. He's demanding that they quit counting votes when they're perfectly legal votes that were cast according to the laws of the states. And he's got a bunch of his supporters believing that there's all this fraud going on when it's not going on. It's just, that's the amazing thing, which I think we're all going to be studying for a long time, is, is the Americans' propensity to believe complete lies and to just ignore the fact that they're dying of the virus. It is, it's amazing. Trump has some kind of hypnotic sway over his, his followers that just erases all critical thought. And it would be nice to understand it. It's a lot like a religion. Anyway, so he's trying to uh, claim he's won. He's trying to start his next term now. He's claiming they need to stop counting and declare him the winner, which is just what happens when democracies collapse. And this is like the worst thing people thought would happen. So uh, analysts are trying to figure out the risk of political violence. They're boarding up stores in San Francisco and in New York and everywhere because they're expecting riots and looting over the election. And the uh, experts in terrorism are deciding that there is, in fact, considerable risk of domestic terrorism at this time. But what is surprising to me is the, they say this will probably not be extremists doing it, which is the same thing I'm seeing. It is not there's a certain amount of lunatics on the far fringes that just want to tear things down, like revolutionary communists and the far right militia guys marching around like the Boogaloo boys. But they say right now, the most likely source of extremism is just relatively normal people caught up in the heat of the moment, like the people that are storming the, um, the counting centers. At this time, when there's a period of uncertainty, this is when this happens. And I saw another article analyzing this, and they said revolutions come not because the people are being greatly abused. They come when they feel like there is no real government and there are no real consequences and they don't know who's in charge. They said that's what really makes it dangerous. So anyway, um, that's why, you know, I think they say the Americans' stability against these internal revolutions, which has been very large, is not so much that our people are treated better or that our, it's that our government has an orderly transition of power from one person to another, so we don't go through periods when you don't know who's in charge. But we're going through one now, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, even Fox News has turned against Trump. I was very surprised to see this. A highly critical article um, about Trump on Fox News saying exactly what I'd see on an ordinary news channel, saying he he has to let the votes be counted. He can't tell you to count the votes in the state's where he's winning and stop counting the votes in the states where he's losing and this doesn't make any sense and you know this is ridiculous which is i agree with it all but i didn't think you were allowed to say that on fox news now, i've heard that ever since ailes died fox news has lost its um its leader so they don't know what they're doing anymore so they tell me i read they have a day group of newscasters who actually try to put out the news and then they have these popular night shows where they just put out uh like hannity and tucker carlson where they just put out lies and they recently sued Tucker Carlson for his lies leading to people dying of the coronavirus, and he defended himself in court by saying, nobody would believe anything I say. The statements made on this show are not the truth, and everyone knows they're not the truth. That's his official position, but that's like Trump, you know, it's, it's a, a, uh, a dog whistle. So when Reagan was shot, that's right, when Reagan was shot, Alexander Haig said, I'm in charge. And foreign nations like the Russians watching that felt like there had been a military coup in America. And the same thing happened when Jimmy Carter, or not Jimmy Carter, um, Bill Clinton was impeached. The Russians thought he had been shot and there had been a military coup. I knew some Russian friends at the time because they said there's no way in the world the president could actually lose his office over something trivial like having sex with someone. That's obviously a transparent cover story and he's obviously been killed and the military has taken over. And you know, in other countries, this happens all the time. You know, the military takes over, the rival poisons his opponent and just takes over, they rig the election. And you know, we, 
we haven't, that's what Trump expects to do here and get away with it. His supporters are okay with it, but a lot of us uh, would like America to be different than that. It's, it is very surprising. And I think the, the lessons are people don't understand civics, they don't understand history, and they don't understand our election process. Uh, it is uh, quite surprising. Anyway, the Democrats are screaming and yelling. There's a conference call. They're very upset. Of course, even though they appear to have gotten rid of Trump, which is the main thing, they totally lost a lot of the Democratic seats. They didn't get the Senate. And uh, many of them feel very lost and betrayed. And they're saying we need to stop being so left and start being more moderate. Don't talk about socialism or defunding the police anymore or anything. Move to the right. And I don't know what's going to come of it all, but there is a lot of like yelling and, and fur flying on the Democratic side. Uh, so Trump has had a held, Trump held a speech today. Apparently, I didn't see it, but I read about it. Then I tried to find video of it, and I couldn't find it. And they said he had tried to held a speech, and as soon as he started saying, I won the election, all the vote counting is fraudulent, all the networks just turned him off and went to play a game show instead. So what's happening is he's been tweeting this stuff, and Twitter's been blocking it all. He's been Facebooking this stuff, and Facebook's been blocking it all. Um, it is just amazing. But everybody knows he's wrong. And nobody wants to be responsible for spreading this stuff, not even Fox News. The only people that seem to spread it are the way wackos like OAN. So it is very interesting. I mean, he's all alone. He's got a few true believers with him. Even Chris Christie is speaking against him, and he was his campaign director. It's just amazing. You know, he's, he's finally going down, and all, everybody's deserting him, except for just a few people that really want to go down at the sinking ship. Um, anyway, yeah, so Facebook removed his group where they're demanding boots on the ground to try to have, you know, a violent revolution in America. People out there demanding to install their leader and just ignore the election, which is what happens in other countries all the time. <laughs> but a lot of us would not like to be and that way here. Bracing for and yep, here's the point. They're boarding everything up. They've been running out of plywood in cities because everyone's trying to board up. I'm not quite sure. It doesn't seem to me like this would lead to a riot and trashing the stores, but a lot of stores seem to believe that. Maybe they're right. Um, so here's a scam I hadn't heard of. Um, their verified Twitter account with the blue check mark then changed their name to Elon Musk to put out a cryptocurrency scam. So apparently, I would think if they verified your account, you would not be allowed to change the name. But maybe they should institute that rule. Anyway, so that... Uh, this, that fooled people into thinking that there's going to be a giveaway. This is the most common scam I see all over the place. I'm going to give away Bitcoin, but you have to give me some first. So Zoom is apparently going to add live captions like YouTube. So that's pretty good for people with, uh, with poor hearing or something. I sort of like it. So anyway, that, that sounds like a good idea. Apparently it's coming out soon, maybe already there. Arm has a new Arm CPU, which is apparently very powerful. And um, so we'll see what comes of it. I know the Apple is supposed to come out with their Apple ARM home computer very soon. And uh, they have a new very powerful ARM. Well, everyone's been talking for the last five years about abandoning Intel and moving to ARM because apparently it's more efficient. I guess we're going to see. This I was pretty surprising. Uh, T-Mobile apparently owns Sprint. And they've hit the $200 million fine because what they've been doing is they've been applying to the government and saying that they have customers on the Lifeline program, which provides government-funded minimal phone service, but they're just lying. There are no customers. They're just pretending to have customers, putting them on a list and collecting the, uh, the payment for that, and now they got busted. So that's pretty outrageous, but I'm glad they got caught anyway. That's pretty shameless stuff. And apparently the Boogaloo Boys are buying... Um, 3D printed parts to convert rifles into illegal machine guns. So apparently you build this thing and they sell it as a wall hanger to uh, uh, make it okay to sell it in online marketplaces and stuff, but it is designed to be a, a slip-in component that'll convert a semi-automatic AR-15 AR to a fully automatic rifle. I know there are various plans to make a fully 3D printed gun and uh, those are a little controversial, and they move on BitTorrent sites and such. And just like uh, the president's speech, a lot of platforms think that's too dangerous to put it out there. I know, I think it was Walmart quit selling guns for a few days, and then he said, oh, I guess we'll keep selling guns anyway, because the gun sales in the last month have been the biggest they've ever been. Everybody's, this tends to happen every time a uh, Democrat is uh, likely to enter the office. All the, um, the gun 
uh, advocates feel like the Democrats are going to take away their guns so they all stock up on guns. Anyway, um, we're all still here. There doesn't seem to be any great riots or anything yet. But uh, I imagine that Biden will be declared the winner probably about tomorrow. And then Trump's loyalists will do something. <laughs> but hopefully they'll just, you know, get drunk and cry in their beer and get used to it. I don't know. Maybe you'll be out there smashing things or something. I don't think Trump can really hold on to power, but he's clearly going to try. Anyway, um, so here we are in 141. Uh, there are a lot of guest lectures coming. There's one on Monday. And now this is all coming from the, uh, the chief security officer of FireEye. He, want, he was very pleased to hear we won this contest. He was very pleased at the reception of his talk. And he has got a whole series of these coming every two weeks. So we got one on Monday uh, about the Amazon Web Services. And then we got a whole series more of them. Um, someone from Qualcomm on November 17 and uh, another FireEye guy on December 7 and a guy from the FBI and the Office of Management and Budget, two people coming on December 15. So these are all extra credit. I highly recommend tuning into them. They're with this group of multiple colleges working together. And so there's a different Zoom link, but they tell me they will record it and put it on YouTube and it won't be behind a paywall or anything. So I hope that works out. I tried to advocate for using my Zoom, but they wanted to use their Zoom. So hopefully that'll work out. Anyway, um, they look like great talks. And uh, you go to any of them, I'll have a page up. You can get extra credit, just like for the last one we had here. So uh, they're all on Mondays and Tuesdays, so they won't directly happen during this class time, but uh, I highly recommend watching these. You know, as you, if you take college classes and learn what's in textbooks, you only get half of what you need. The other half is what really happens on the job. So I highly recommend uh, hearing from people that are really on the job uh, to prepare you for employment in the world of security. A lot of my students are getting good jobs, and they say they're happy with what they learned here, but you know, you only learn half of what you need from a college. You really need to interact with the real professionals. So anyway, today's topic is Diffie-Hellman. This was amazing. This was a top secret NSA security protocol that they concealed reportedly for 20 years and used for secrecy. And, but then it was reinvented by mathematicians on the outside. And this is the problem, of course. Cryptography is just math. And sooner or later, somebody else will get smart and reinvent the math. So um, anyway, the... Diffie and Hellman developed this thing, and I came across it in 1979 when it was published in Scientific American, and I was fascinated, like all the computer programmers and mathematically oriented people of my age. It was a miracle. You could send secret information over an untrusted channel without previously exchanging secrets. It would seem to be impossible, but it's not impossible, and here's how it works. You do not transmit a secret over the wire but you agree on a secret by sending pieces of it over the wire. And it relies on a difficult one-way problem. So in this case, this is what I wanted to talk about last time and I got a little befuddled. This is where you use the Z star P and P is really a prime. Now, this group includes all the integers from one to P minus one, nice and simple. And now you just choose two random elements in this group, A and B, just random numbers and you also pick a number G, which is not secret, and often you just use two. It could be any simple number. So you read, we're gonna, G is a generator of the group. And if you have a prime number here, every number is a generator of the group, so it's all nice and simple. So now uh, the person at one end picks a number A and keeps it secret, and they send G to the A, of course, modulus P. And this person chooses another number B and transmits G to the B. So the point is the numbers that go over the wire are related to A and B, but they're not equal to A and B. And you cannot find A and B without solving the discrete logarithm problem, which we've talked about. If you know G to the A, finding A is in fact a very hard problem. So now that you've done that, Alice calculates capital A is G to the A and sends that across. Bob calculates capital B is G to the B and sends that across. Now, Alice takes the B she got from Bob to the A, and that's G to the AB. And Bob takes the A he got from Alice to the B, and that's the same number. So now they have agreed on a shared secret, but the numbers they've sent over the wire are not easily reduced to the shared secret. 
So this is how you do it. You can agree on a shared secret at both ends without ever directly sending it over the wire. And it's secure as long as the discrete logarithm problem is hard and there's no way for someone to figure out little a from g to the a. So it's incredibly simple, easy to understand, and it works. And it's at the heart of essentially all public key encryption on the internet now. This is how you do it. Um, so now, in fact, it turns out that this raw number g to the a b is not really a great idea to just take that number directly and use it as like an AES key because that number is uh, random from one to P and that means it's not, not all the bits are random. Um, turns out that the uh, lower order bit is more likely to be zero because P is not equal to two to the N if you like. So if you just take, like if you went from one to uh, 10, there'd be eight of those numbers with a zero on the left and only it's less than eight with uh, one on the, on the, uh, as the leftmost bit. So, you know, it's not exactly random enough. So what you ought to do is run it through a hash function to turn that, take that G to the AB and run it through a hash function. That'll effectively randomize the bits and then you get a good thing to use for an AES key. But, you know, that's a minor detail and it works fine. Uh, now, it turns out, by the way, that if you choose certain values of P and the generator, there are conditions under which um, you would have a small subgroup and you might find that your G to the A is actually going around in a little loop or something and it makes it easier to guess. So it's better if you choose a safe prime and a safe prime is where P is prime and half of P rounded down is also prime. Otherwise um, the security of it is lower and that early version of it didn't think of that and they discovered there were certain conditions under which uh, the guessing was easier than it should have been, so they switched to safe primes. And safe primes are therefore slower to generate, a thousand times as long. In fact, I started one here, yeah, and it took 12 minutes. Holy cow, yeah. I just, I ran this, and then I got bored and looked away. This was me generating uh, safe Diffie-Hellman exchange keys that were 4,096 bits long, and it took it 12 minutes. So it really does take quite a while, because all it can do is keep generating them, testing to see if they're safe, I guess. <coughs> anyway, using safe primes is better. So when I tried it before, 2048-bit key took 154 seconds and so on. It's uh, very computationally intensive. All right. An RSA key is much simpler because an RSA is just finding P and Q that are prime and multiplying together to get N. And they do not have to be safe primes. They can just be any old primes and it works. So it would be about a thousand times faster. <coughs> All right. So that's the point is the discrete logarithm problem. Your secret value is A. The public value is G to the A. Everybody's allowed to see G and they're allowed to see G to the A, but they can't recover A. That's the discrete logarithm problem. So the evil attacker in the middle can see the public values G to the A and G to the B, but they can't derive A or B from that. Now, um, so you might consider the computational problem, the one I just described, um, where, now suppose, however, they don't really need to know A and B. What they really need to do is find G to the A times B. So it might be possible that from these values, you could derive that value without knowing A or B, but no way to do that has been found. However, to be, you know, to be mathematically precise, this is not exactly equal to the discrete logarithm problem. It's related, but it's possible that might be an easier problem, although so far there's no evidence that it is. Um, the fastest way to solve the discrete logarithm problem itself is the number sieve, which we talked about before, and that is um, like a general number sieve used on RSA. And it turns out, of course, that if you have a 2048-bit key, it's not that you have to do two to the 2048 commutations at all. It's much faster, but that would give you about 90 bits of security, just like Diffie Hellman. So 2048 is considered unbreakable now, and people recommend 4096 to give you some room for the future. Um, all right, and there is a decisional Diffie Hellman problem related to the other Diffie Hellman problems if you want to mathematically analyze. And uh, you might say, now remember, I. The real Diffie-Hellman problem would be finding A and B. Uh, that other pro weaker problem might be to find G to the AB, but what if you could find just a few bits about A or B? If you just like a few bits on one side or the other to make it easier, uh, that would be nice to say you can't do that either. So um, if you choose the parameters well, then the bits are completely random and you can't deduce anything about them. What they're thinking about here is an attack like the one that hurt RC4 talked about before. RC4 has a problem 
that the first few bits are not random. They have a higher probability of being 127 than anything else, and therefore, if you do millions of encryptions, you can deduce something about the key from them. And uh, this would be a problem if you choose P unwisely, it has a similar problem here. So you have to choose the parameters with those safe primes, and you avoid having that kind of indirect leakage of the key. So, you know, it's a good system, and uh, even its minor weaknesses have been addressed by these um, improvements. So, all right, you can do it, by the way. There are techniques that agree on a key without using Diffie-Hellman. There have been a few for a while. This is what 3G and 4G use, authenticated key agreement, and it just has a pre-shared secret key. So then it adds a little bit more math to it, so it's not as simple as just using the pre-shared key. Um, each, your SIM card has a key, and your provider knows the key, and then they take a random number R, and you shoot a random functions to create a number that goes over the network. So it's not as simple as just always using the same key, but it is based on that shared secret. Now you can have a replay attack where I capture the um, values exchanged in one session, and I can use them to impersonate the telco next time, but you're supposed to have a protocol that makes sure that I'm not allowed to use any previous random number again, so that your phone will not be tricked if I'm just replaying stored traffic from the telephone service provider. Um, if somebody was to steal your shared secret key, then they would be able to listen to listen to everything, impersonate either party, record communications, and later decrypt them. So that would be bad. And so you might want to add something to protect, prevent that. So here's attack models. If I'm a man in the middle and I can see all the public messages, then you have to make sure that the, the messages sent down the wire, which by the way, in telco, are not even supposed to be a shared wire, but it could be, that it shouldn't leak any information about the secret. The data leak is where I can actually get the session key and temporary secrets, but not the long-term secret. And the breach is where I actually learn your long-term secret key. And you ought to consider how secure it is in each of these security. And so um, another, there's various uh, goals. You might want to authenticate the people at both ends. Uh, the authenticated key agreement is when both ends actually prove who they are. And uh, so key control means neither party can control the final shared secret. Uh, so if I manage to impersonate one property, I won't be able to use it to control the key, but one party. And then there's forward secrecy. We talked about a lot for TLS. Uh, the National Security Agency in America is trying to perform this attack. They're archiving all the encrypted internet traffic in Utah and have been for years, hoping that they will later find the keys and be able to retroactively decrypt that stuff. And that was possible up until TLS 1.2 but TLS 1.2 and 1.3 now have forward secrecy where every session has a different key. So even if you do eventually breach the fixed secret, you can't decrypt a whole bunch of communications with it for that reason. So uh, another issue is the performance of it. How much computation does it require uh, to exchange data back and forth? Um, in a good system, your latency would be just around trip time. Your computations would be fast enough that you don't slow it down much more than just sending data over the wire. That would be nice. Um, and 3G and 4G uh, are designed to be very fast. You can even do a bunch of pre-computation and have values ready to go at the carrier so uh, they can really respond quickly, of course, because that's a big issue. You want everyone to get their phone calls quickly and you don't want them waiting for some kind of computation. Um, all right. So there's a lot of Diffie-Hellman based protocols. Anonymous Diffie-Hellman was the first one where you just do this. You pick an A and you pick a B, you exchange these values and that's it. Um, there's, you can have a man in the middle attack here, which will totally compromise this one. If you just do, if the attacker is evil, you pick the A, they send you G to the A. This person just picks a different number and sends that to Bob. Then they lie to Bob and get disencrypted with a key this person knows now, and then they lie to this person, and there's a key they know about, and now they can decrypt everything and get through with a man in the middle because the, remember, every, every uh, system is generally vulnerable. The only way to get around a man in the middle attack is to have a third channel that you trust. There has to be like a third party, like a certificate authority to tell you what's going on, or there has to be a pre-shared key, which amounts to a third party in time. There was a previous time when you exchanged some data that the attacker did not get in the middle of. But you have to, there's no way you could ever stop a man in the middle attack if you don't have some other bit of information to know who you're talking to. So that's authenticated Diffie-Hellman. And um, 
So they each have a private key and they can verify the signature using the public key, which did not, which the attacker did not get to interfere with the receiving of the public key. That's the point. So again, they have some kind of a public, uh, public repository of keys that the attacker is not in the middle of. How do they agree on G without compromise? Well, it turns out G is not a secret. So in fact, everybody pretty much just uses two. So G doesn't matter as long as you both know it. So that can just be written on the sky. Uh, the same, that's like E in uh, RSA. The E can just, everybody pretty much just uses the same value of E. So it really doesn't matter. You don't really need to exchange it very much. Uh, it's all the secrecy is in the other numbers. So authenticated Diffie Hellman stops eavesdroppers because they can't learn the shared secret and nobody can control the shared secret. Now, if you replay these numbers, um, they can, that might fool them, but you could send a message to prove that you actually own, still own the shared secret with a challenge, combine it with shared secret and send it back, that sort of thing. And that would help prevent a replay message from working. So then you got data leaks. If Eve gets A, she can impersonate Alice. But if you incorporate long-term keys into the shared secret, then Eve wouldn't have the older key. This is what I've said. You have basically a previous shared secret transmitted at an earlier time when the attacker was not in the middle. That would amount to your third party there. There's another system, the MQV system, which the NSA designed, and it's considered more secure and faster, but it was copyrighted. Um, so anyway, it works with uh, long-term private keys and long-term public keys. And then it also uses Diffie-Hellman in addition to that. And this is considered fast and secure. Um, and uh, it can even survive breaches pretty well. But it turned out it was encumbered by copyright or patents. And so nobody really bothered with it much. And everybody uses the other system, authenticated Diffie-Hellman, which you may have noticed is a, a song you've heard me sing many times in this class. The very latest, coolest mathematical technique is in principle better, but another one became the standard years ago, and everybody's just using the standard because it's good enough. All right. Anyway, um, so things that can go wrong. Uh, if you don't hash the shared secret, like I mentioned, then you're using a number for your shared secret key that is not really random. It's not really got an equal probability of each bit being zero or one, and therefore it's... Um, in principle, not really as strong as it should be. You should run it through a hash function, key derivation function to randomize it. The RSA was patented, you're right, but I think they let everybody use it without paying for it. It's a very good point. I mean, RSA is the company and they did patent it, but I don't think they kept it secret or something. Or it's, I don't know the history. I know it became the standard and I know everybody uses it without paying them anything now. So maybe they agreed to let the whole world use it. You paid to use, everybody paid to use RSA? Huh, okay, that's interesting. People are still paying to use RSA? Um, really? How much, no, no, RSA encryption. Multi-prime RSC, there's patent. Um, a look at RSA in the seminal patent. Legal restrictions. Uh, RSA encryption patent released in 2000. Okay. Right. Okay. So people might have paid at one time, but not for a while. It can now be used free of charge as of 2000. Right. Okay. They unexpectedly released it into the public domain in 2000. Okay. So before that, people might have paid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah, I had, I know um, this, by the way, led to an interesting article today. There was a, um, I heard about this this week, Microsoft, Google announced that in Chrome, they're going to have their own um, trusted root certificate store. And the reason, anyway, they pointed the first certificate store was in Mozilla because Netscape invented SSL. And before anybody else supported it, they supported it entirely in the browser. So Netscape had the first trusted root certificate store. And it was only much later that they built it into operating systems and people got used to trusting the operating system store. Anyway, um, yeah, I guess people must have paid for it before then. I guess maybe Netscape paid because Netscape built SSL using RSA. Maybe Netscape had been paying uh, royalties on it then. It would be sort of interesting to look into that. Yeah, it was issued to MIT in 1983 and licensed to RSA. 
Huh, so I guess in the 80s and 90s, people were paying. Hmm, that's interesting. Anyway, good, I'm glad you brought it up. That's an interesting fact that's not included here. Anyway, um, legacy Diffie-Hellman was in quite a few versions of TLS. There were a lot of old cipher suites that you would see if you used Wireshark and watched the handshake using um, Diffie-Hellman Anonymous. But various, uh, uh, and anonymous Diffie-Hellman is not considered safe enough because a man in the middle attacks. So I think all these are deprecated now. And you won't see them. Also, OpenSSL lets you use unsafe primes. And that is, again, not a good idea because you can craft Diffie-Hellman parameters that reveal information and you can, can close in on a key. So that was fixed, but only quite recently, 2016. So it goes on like everything else. They keep finding bugs and fixing them. Let's take a look at some coops. Uh, this is it, 141. Well, I saw it. There, 141, Chapter 11. All right. Safe prime and unsafe primes. The difference is the safe prime has not only the prime, but if you take half of the prime and round it down, that number is also prime. That's the difference. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. So, what modulus should be used in Diffie Hellman? Yep, safe primes are the best things to use. All right. <clears throat> Which one is a fast attack on Diffie Hellman? That's the number sieve, good. All right, what property mitigates against man in the middle? That's it, authentication means you make sure who you're talking to. So if it's a person in the middle, you will be able to detect that they do not have whatever secret they should have. All right, what system is the most secure but rarely used? MQV, rarely used in principle better. All right, and we'll have to tell me who they are. And who as well. All right, they're all gonna have to come out of the closet. I see a couple have come out in the uh, chat. Let me stop this recording and then I'll see who we got. <clears throat> 